So back when we were in chapter 3, we talked about one of the applications of derivatives as being the link between, or among, position, velocity, and acceleration. If you have a position function and you're interested in finding a velocity function, or if you have a velocity function and you're interested in finding an acceleration function, you can do so by finding derivatives. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that you have an acceleration and you're interested in finding a velocity or you have a velocity and you're interested in finding a position. In that case, you would be applying antiderivatives. Now, a very common example of where antiderivatives come up is on the surface of the Earth when we talk about projectile motion. Projectile motion is referring to the motion of anything that is flying through the air. So this is the motion of objects that are accelerating by gravity alone. That is to say, the only force that's acting on the object is the force due to gravity. Now we can model that quite easily by saying that the acceleration function of the object is simply going to be g. G is defined as the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth, and on the surface of the Earth, that acceleration has two different sets of units. In metric units, to two significant figures, this would be negative 9.8 meters per second per second, or in terms of feet, this would be 32 feet per second per second. Now we're also going to throw on a couple of initial conditions associated with this. We'll throw on the fact that the initial velocity is going to be defined as whatever we define it as. We'll call it v naught for the time being. <clears throat> and also the initial position will be associated with whatever height it is off the ground. Now do bear in mind that this is only for acceleration in one direction, and that direction is vertical. This does not take into account horizontal displacement. So with those things in mind, essentially what we have here is the second derivative of position with respect to time is equal to g. Taking an antiderivative will take us to s prime of t. Now acceleration due to gravity is a constant, therefore it'll be the constant times whatever the variable happens to be. In this case that would be t plus whatever our constant of anti-differentiation is. Then we can plug in our first initial condition that v of 0 is equal to v naught. So do keep in mind that when I say s prime of t, I am referring to v of t. That's the derivative of position, is velocity. So that lets us know that if I plug in t equals 0, I will get v naught. leading us to the fact that that constant of anti-differentiation is v naught. So recopying what our velocity is, this will be acceleration due to gravity times t plus whatever the initial velocity is. Now do keep in mind that velocity is a vector quantity, therefore it has a direction associated with it. Because we've defined acceleration due to gravity to be negative, we'll assume that the negative direction means downward, and the positive direction means upward. Now one more antiderivative will get us back to our position function. The antiderivative of a constant times t would be that constant times, according to the power rule, one half t squared. v naught is whatever our initial velocity is, that is a constant, so we'll see a constant times t, and then another um, constant of anti-differentiation. Now we defined the initial position to be whatever the height is off the ground and if we plug in t equals zero we're going to get that that is our constant of anti-differentiation. So that's from plugging in t equals zero. This would be zero, this would be zero, this would be d, and this will be the height. So that lets us know that the position 
of an object vertically after t seconds is going to be 1 half times g times t squared plus v naught times t plus whatever the initial height happens to be. Now with that in mind, I would like to take a look at the following problem. A stone is dropped off of a cliff and hits the ground at 120 feet per second. Question becomes, how tall is the cliff? <clears throat> now technically speaking, there is a physics way to do a problem like this. So if you've seen a problem like this in physics and know all of your rectilinear motion um, formulas, please know that every single one of them came from doing derivatives and antiderivatives. So what I would like to do is set up our acceleration, our velocity, and our position functions. Now I notice that when we were given a velocity, we were given feet per second. Now because we were given feet per second, we are going to make use of the units feet per second per second for our acceleration due to gravity. So the acceleration function is going to be negative 32. Our velocity function is going to be negative 32t plus whatever the initial velocity is. We were told that the stone was dropped. Now if it's dropped, that means that we were giving it no initial velocity. Whereas if we were told that it was thrown with a certain initial velocity, that would be a different case. Now one more antiderivative, I take half of 32, I'm going to get negative 16 t squared plus whatever the height of the cliff was. We'll assume that the ground is a height of zero, or uh, excuse me, we'll assume that the ground is a position of zero and the top of the cliff is going to be a position of H. So a stone is dropped from up here and heads down there. Now here are some things that we know. When it hits the ground, so when S is equal to zero, we know that the velocity is going to be equal to not just 120, but rather negative 120. This is due to the fact that because it's accelerating in the downward direction, its velocity will be negative throughout. So what I'm going to do is take my velocity function and my position function, set s equal to zero, and set v equal to 100, uh, negative 120. So v is negative 120, that'll be equal to negative 32t. The position will be zero, that'll be equal to negative 16t squared, plus h. This sets up a system of two equations with two variables, those two variables being t and h. I think what I'd like to do is first solve this equation for t. We can do so by dividing both sides by negative 32. I know that 8 will go into both of these and we can cancel the negatives as well. We'll wind up with 15 over 4. Now uh, that's a time, and time was given in seconds, so that'll be 15.4 seconds. Excuse me, 15 quarters seconds, not 15.4. If I solve this equation for h, I will get that h is equal to positive 16t squared. However, I now know what t value I can plug in. So this will be 16 times 15 quarters squared. That is to say, this will be 16 times 15 squared over 4 squared, but I also know that 4 squared happens to be 16 
the 16s will cancel each other out. 15 squared is going to be 225. Because this was an application problem, we need units on our final answer. Because the velocity was given as feet per second, we're assuming that the position will have units of feet, time will have units of seconds. This was a position, therefore, 225 feet tall. Now, for those that are interested in the physics that's associated with this, the physics associated with this is that V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2 times G times whatever the change in height happened to be. Now, if we were to take all of the things that we know and plug them into this, the final velocity was negative 120. The initial velocity was 0. Acceleration due to gravity was negative 32. And height is a thing that we would be solving for. <clears throat> now, this will give us height as a negative quantity because of the change in position being in the negative direction as well. It doesn't take a whole lot of algebra to solve for this. This will be h is equal to negative 120 squared divided by 2 times negative 32, which I feel like tossing into a calculator. Negative 120 squared divided by 2 times negative 32. We happen to get the same quantity as what we got using the calculus method. This one says negative because the overall change in position was negative. This one, we assumed that s equals 0 was the bottom and that this was the top. So given that it dropped 225 feet, that means that the height of the cliff would be positive 225 feet. So all of those formulas that we know from physics came from calculus.